everybody welcome to class this week uh to another uh episode and a little bit of commentary on uh, jason kappa's uh, fame uh, work essence of true eloquence and so today I'd just like to do a little bit of a shorter class just on um a sort of brief uh, biographical sketch of jason kappa who he was as one of um tibet and asia's greatest buddhist saints uh, great scholar great yogi uh, great masita great healer uh, and just sort of some of the factors that led up to him composing this work. So we get a little, just a little bit of a context and background for his work. Okay, so we'll just start with um, <clears throat> the Heart Sutra here. Essence of the Perfection of Wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Homage of Perfection of Wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Thus I've heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgri or in Mass Montrose Mountain because the great assembly of monks and the great assembly of bodhisattvas. That time the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time also the spirit of Alkshvara, the bodhisattva, the great being, was looking perfectly at the price of profound perfection of wisdom, perfectly at the emptiness of inherent existence and also the five aggregates. Then the power of Buddha, Venerable Shari Putra said to Spirit of for the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, how should a son of the lineage train who wishes to engage in the path of profound professional wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Spirit of Lokshvara, the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, replied to Venerable Shari Putra as follows. Shari Putra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the path of profound professional wisdom should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly at the emptiness of inherent existence and also the five aggregates, form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, and form is not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shri Pacha, like this, all phenomena are merely empty, having no characteristics. They do not produce, produce and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shri Pacha, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile no object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element, so forth, up to no element, uh, mind element, also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, and no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there is no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted wisdom, no attainment, also no non attainment. Therefore, Sherry Pacha, because there is no attainment, but what he sat is rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing utterly beyond perversity to the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times have relied upon the perfection of wisdom became manifest, complete Buddhas in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal and equal mantra, the mantra that really pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. Mantra of perfection of wisdom is proclaimed, Tayatam, Gata Gata Paragata Parasam, Gata Bodhi Soham. Shri Pucha Bodhisattva, great being, should train the profound perfection of wisdom like this. Then the Blessed One arose that concentration, said to Spirit of Shri, the Bodhisattva, the great being, that is spoken well. Good God of Son and uh, Lineage is like that. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed in that way, the profound perfection of wisdom should be practiced, and Tathya Gattis will also rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shri Pucha said to Spirit uh, uh, of Alokashvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, we're delighted in how we praise what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, so um, let's just uh, actually start with a quick uh, meditation here uh, on Gandalagema, like we've been doing uh, for uh, our Lama Sankapa Guru Yoga. And um, we can just uh, visualize ourselves seated in a wide open space. And um, we always see that the ground is like lapis lazuli. So just smooth, uh, warm, uh, you know, sort of soft to the touch, easy to sit on. And we are surrounded by all sentient beings. So uh, just kind of like a big audience at an auditorium, a beautiful uh, sky blue dome above us, clear empty sky. <clears throat> and um, we've got our mother on our left, father on our right, people we love the most is support behind us and people we like the least have issues with in front of us as um, objects of compassion and healing. And taking it from there, we can think of uh, human beings from all over the world, especially beings um, like just so everyone without exception being with us. Meditating, we can think in particular in front of us, places where there's a lot of suffering, all the different wars and conflicts and injustices and um, 
you know, environmental problems and so forth, uh, exploitation, all the sort of huge um, multi-level sufferings that humans are going through uh, now at the moment, just really, really hold all these beings uh, in our hearts with love and compassion. We can feel that all the beings in the animal realm or natural ecosystems are here with us. Countless beings in the same way uh, from the spirit world here, all the different sort of um, spirit planes and dimensions. Celestial beings, gods, demigods, and the vast majority of sentient beings being hell beings and hungry uh, ghost beings being here with us. So it's just like a big happy family. We're all here meditating together. <laughs> So all of us looking up in the sky, we can see them just like the big moon coming to join the earth here um, with us meditating in front of us. We're having a, a vision of the Buddha realm or Buddha paradise, uh, pure land of Tashida or Gandhin pure land. Pure land of all the universal Buddhas who teach Buddhism, like our, our Buddha, fourth universal Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni, as well as the um, uh, sort of pure land of the Buddha of Wisdom and Jishri. So in particular, sort of as Glupas or Gandhin tradition practitioners, we are sort of making the appeal that all these Buddhas come down and the universal Buddhism teach us. So in particular, the next one is the um, Buddha Maitreya, Buddha of loving kindness, who will appear in the earth in the coming years and teach a new form of Buddhism based around love. So in this pure land, we have, uh, you know, forests and mountains and valleys and lakes and so forth, all beautiful natural environments. And then just kind of like a little uh, city here, Temple City, with uh, monasteries and nunneries and cathedrals, shrines and temples and so forth. With all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and yogis, yoginis, enlightened beings being here. And the central cathedral, the center of town here. It's open and we can see inside is the future Buddha, Buddha of loving kindness, fifth universal Buddha Maitreya, golden energy body seated in a um, throne, like kind of like on a chair. And with his hands and turning the wheel of uh, Dharma Mudra, holding two white lotuses at his ears with a, a ape spoke to a golden Dharma chakra on one and a golden initiation vase on the other. He's wearing a crown and very, very beautiful. And on, um, his a writer, our left, is the founder of the old Kadampa tradition, famous Indian guru, Atisha. And on our writer, his left, is founder of new Kadampa tradition, our tradition, J. Kappa, from whom we are studying his famed text, Essence of True Eloquence. And J. Kappa is in the way we usually visualize him with the three robes of monk, yellow pen, his cap, holding to um, with the, the Mudra turn the wheel of Dharma, holding two white lotuses with the flaming sword and um, Dharma text of Prajnaparamita on it. So as we just uh, request for this, as we do the Guru Yoga, we can just feel that at Maitreya's heart, we get kind of like a golden <laughs> um, eternal knot symbol that becomes sort of fluffy white clouds. And on it are again, Jason Kappa uh, uh, on a lion throne, uh, Lotus and Moon. And Sun Seat, he's a, a beautiful monk in lotus position, as we usually see him in the yellow robes and yellow pants cap. And again, holding the two white lotuses, turning the Mudra Dharma. In front of him, on his right or our left, is the first Ganon throne holder, his first foremost older student, Japa Gyatso, who's wearing three robes of a monk. He's got his uh, right hand, the teaching Mudra, his heart, and left hand is holding a Dharma text at his um, lap. On the other side, our right, or J. Sankapa's left, is Kajubje, his other thing student. So it's always kind of like the three of them you see together. He's in the same position there with three robes of a monk, yellow pants, cap, teaching mudra. And let's just focus in particular today at J. Sankapa's heart. And at his heart is the Buddha of wisdom, Manjushri. And Manjushri is in Buddha form. So uh, uh, lion throne, lotus, um, sun seat. And he's got wonderful um, uh, golden energy body holding with his right hand in the, the sort of threatening mudra, a flaming sword above his head. 
and left hand in three jewels mudra, we just the uh, white lotus with the Prashna Paramita text on it. And at his heart is the mantra of Murupatsanadi. Running clockwise in the center of it is a golden D letter, D-H-I, if you'd like to visualize it in English. Otherwise, uh, the Tibetan letter is Sanskrit letter. And that's kind of like the primordial vibration of that Buddha. So visualizing this whole beautiful vision here, to take refuge. I take refuge in Buddha Dharma and the Sangha to attain enlightenment. By the merit accumulated from practicing generosity and perfections, we attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge in Buddha Dharma and Sangha to attain enlightenment. By the merit accumulated from practicing generosity and perfections, we attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge in Buddha Dharma and Sangha to attain enlightenment. By the merit accumulated from practicing generosity and perfections, we attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. So in particular, just generating refuge at our heart, our sort of intention, your pure intention. Taking refuge in the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Buddha as a doctor, the Dharma as a medicine for all of our true sufferings. It's kind of like the four noble truths here. So true sufferings, true origins, true cessations, and true paths. It's like the medicine in our health regime to get better, to stop our sickness of old age, um, sort of uh, birth, uh, aging, old age, sickness, and death, all those sufferings. And Sangha is the nurses or EMTs that help the doctor there. And now generating uh, bodhicitta, the in sort of mind of great compassion, intention of great compassion, that everything we do lead to our enlightenment, that we become a Buddha, that we lead all sentient beings to enlightenment as well. Generating love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. May all beings have happiness in its causes. May all beings be free of suffering in its causes. May all beings constantly dwell in joy, transcend sorrow. May all beings dwell in equal love for both those close and distant. So the invocation here, from the heart of the protector, the hundreds of deities of the joyful land, to the peak of the clouds like a cluster of fresh white curd, all knowing Lo Sang Drap, the king of the Dharma, please come to this place together with your two chief disciples. So as we recite that, just feels just like rolling out a yoga mat or a carpet here. The clouds start to come down, holding the three gurus coming down, kind of unrolling from uh, Maitreya's heart. So they're just a little bit in front of us and above us here, us and all sentient beings. Just like the bridge, the rainbow bridge connecting us to uh, to Shida Pureland. It's kind of through these three figures and their teachings, their example, and their blessing that we can sort of walk the bridge over to enlightenment here. In the space before me, in a line from Lotus and Moon, the Venerable Guru smiled delight. Screen feel from my mind of faith. Please remain for a hundred ends to spread the teaching. Your minds of wisdom, realizing the full extent of objects of knowledge. Your eloquent speech is the ear ornament of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies are ablaze with the glory of renown. I prostrate to you, to whom to see, to hear, and to remember so meaningful. Pleasing water offerings, various flowers, sweet-smelling incense, light, scented water, and so forth. A vast lot of offerings, both set out and imagined, offered a supreme field of merit. Whatever non-virtues of body, speech, and mind I've accumulated since time without beginning, especially transgressions of my three levels of vows, with great remorse I did clear each one from the depths of my heart. In this degenerate age, you store for much learning and accomplishment, bending the eight worldly concerns you made your leisure and endowment meaningful. Protector from the very depths of my heart, I rejoice in the great wave of your deeds. From the billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion, the space of your enlightened minds, venerable holy gurus, please send down a rain of vast and profound dharma appropriate to the disciples of this world. May your Vajra body, created from the purity of clear light, free the rising and setting of cyclic existence, but visible to the ordinary view only as sun subtle physical form. Stand unchanging without waiting until samsara ends. Through the virtues I've accumulated here, may the teachings and all living beings receive every benefit, especially may the essence of the teachings of Lama Jason Kappa shine forever. Offering to Jason Kappa and the merit field here, beautiful um, purified universe of the mandala here. This feels all covered in flowers as well. 
This mandala is, ba uh, is built on a base for splendid flowers, saffron, water, and incense, adorned with Mount Meru, the four lands, the sun, and the moon. By offering this pure mandala to you, as somebody who is uh, here before me, may all living beings experience pure happiness and be reborn in the pure lands. Oh, Madame Guru Rana Mandala, come here to Yami. Say, say, we send forth this beautiful purified universe, this mandala to you, precious gurus. Now coming down like sunlight in particular from the D syllable at Manjushri's heart at um, Jason Katha's heart. So just beams of light coming down and nectar and energy coming down just like sunlight. We can just feel it's almost like, you know, you're in the house and you've got the sunbeams coming in from the window. You know, you always have that, you know, as your kid, you're on the rocking chair, a little chair like this, and you can see just the, you know, the cats playing with the sunbeams and so forth. Just all that kind of gold and energy, wisdom energy coming into us, us and all sentient beings around us as we recite um, the long mixing mantra of uh, Jason Kappa. Mig me se we ter chen chen rezi. Dream me ken pe wong po jam pao yang. Du pung ma lu hu chom se he sang we dan. Gan chen ke pe sung ken song ka pa. Lo zang dra pe he sha bla so wa de. Mig me he se we te her chen chen raisi. Three Mig me se we ter chen chen rezi. Dream again pe wong po jam pao yang. Du pun ma lu jom se sang we dan. Gan chen ke pe sung ken song ka pa. Lo zan tra pe sha bla so one So this beautiful golden energy settles into us, all sentient beings. And we recite the dedication prayer here and do the visualization as well. Lord Special's Root Guru, please come to the lotus and then seat at my crown. In your great kindness, please remain with me and bestow upon me blessings of your body, speech, and mind. Lord's precious Rukuru, please ascend the lotus and seat my heart. In your great kindness, please remain with me and grant me the common and supreme realizations. Lord's precious Rukuru, please remain the lotus and seat my heart. In your great kindness, please remain with me and remain firm until I attain the essence of enlightenment. So with this, we visualize that our hearts now kind of like a hollow body, central channel from our crown down to our hearts. In our heart chakra, we can visualize about the size of a dime, a sort of flat. Um, eight uh, petaled lotus, white lotus, made of beautiful white energy. And on it is a uh, white moon disc. And we request the Buddhas here, Jason Kappa and Maitreya, please grant us your blessings. And when we ask that, we can just feel that Tashita Pure Land starts to melt into uh, golden light. All the valleys and mountains, forests, lakes, and so forth, animals, all the different holy beings. Everything melting into the temples, they all melt into Maitreya. All the holy beings too, like even Atisha and Jason Kappa melt into him. And he's just like a beautiful golden sun, like a ball of energy coming towards us, dissolving all the white clouds until he dissolves into Jason Kappa. Now Chapagatso and Kedrupche turn into balls of golden light and dissolve into Jason Kappa. And then Jason Kappa, we can just feel that he melts into golden light into his heart, from above and below into his heart, into Manjushri. And then Manjushri becomes like a beautiful golden ball of energy, like a sun. 
And this starts to shrink till it's quite small, like a little star. And comes to the crown of our head, enters our central channel, and this little star, a little sun, dissolves into our heart. And as it sort of lands down on in the center of the moon disk, which is at the center of the white lotus, white lotus slowly closes up just like a tulip at night. And we have the two mantras going around the top clockwise, Amarapat Sanadi, Manjushri Mantra, and below counterclockwise, Jason Kappa's Mantra. Om Agura Vashadar Samadhi CD. And then this beautiful lotus melts into light here and dissolves into us. All the wisdom, compassion, power of the Buddhas go directly into us, all that energy, blessing energy. And just we are empowered. It's just like you know, a little video game or charging your phone up. Get all these qualities and all the spiritual energy and openness at our heart. Okay, so let's start our class. And again, welcome from Hong Kong, my little, <laughs> my apartment. Uh, well, sort of, it's almost like an apartment, a little one, uh, or a nice hotel room. And um us able to go to the temples here this week, which is really nice with a uh, close friend of mine. Uh, leaving tomorrow and uh, two days in a row, kind of crappy days. Uh, we had really, really huge, almost like a typhoon thunderstorm last night, which is quite something. Um, you know, we used to get really bad thunderstorms in Toronto, but you don't know thunderstorms till you're over here in Asia, kind of like at this time of year with all the humidity and everything. So anyway, let's get started here with our wonderful um, class. I'm just going to just fix the phone here for one sec. Okay, perfect. Um, so a few uh, biographical details. So again, there's always Wikipedia. You don't have to listen to me if you want uh, uh, a good uh, um, sort of short uh, presentation of Jason Kappa's life. This is, he's becoming more and more popular. More and more people know of him and he's being studied more all over the world, which is amazing because at, um, you know, the time of the fall of Tibet uh, and the fall even of the Qing dynasty, he was seen as probably you know, how do you know who's the most famous uh, sort of saint or philosopher in Asia? But he's definitely up there. And uh, the Galupa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism was all the way into the Kalachakra Temple in St. Petersburg under Tsar Nicholas. Second, uh, obviously in India, uh, in Nepal, Mongolia, Siberia, up in Barasia, up in, and in Northeast China. And of course, was from the time of the early uh, Qing or Manchu uh, emperors, the sort of um, Manchurians were all Tibetan Buddhists, that, but it was kind of like the official state uh, religion of uh, China during the Manchu or Qing dynasty right up until 1911. And uh, Emperor Dowager Zizi, like in the Forbidden City, they've got like Tibetan Buddhist temples. So Jason Kampam, um, you can get see even at the Lama Temple, Yongzhen Lama Temple in um, Beijing, they have all wonderful kind of museum and you'll see beautiful Jason Kampa statues. And of course they have the huge three story or however big it is, wonderful Jason Kampa statue that I love so much. I for, for many years would go there every uh, Lunar New Year's to make offerings. So that's how popular he was. And uh, in the West, um, uh, Robert Thurman, Professor Robert Thurman, I guess for uh, Tibetan Library of Works and Archives, wrote that first um, uh, excellent, it's very good I have, it's kind of like old 1970s copy or something that I have uh, for his life story, Jason Kappas. I think it's Life and Teachings of Jason Kappa. Very, very good. They have some of his works in there. And um, as Dalai Lama always says, uh, 14th Zone Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyasso, um, says that you 
the, his life was extensively historically um, uh, recorded in detail. So it, it's not like some kind of Star Wars or myth, Lord of the Rings um, fable or fairy tale. Um, it was, but when you're reading his life story, it's just it's kind of hard to believe. One of the reasons it's hard to believe, besides all the sort of mystical or sort of occult or supernatural stuff in his life, which as Buddhists, we like all that stuff. But just even just on the historical record, he was just able to do so much. I mean, it was a guy that never wasted any time, unlike me, for, for instance. And he was just able to be just like an incredible yogi in retreat, an incredible scholar and philosopher, uh, compiling texts and writing like tons of commentaries uh, on all the classical uh, Indian Buddhist texts, the Kangir and, Ten and Tenjur, for instance. Uh, and um, he was an incredible teacher. So he's also teaching and founding the new Kadampa tradition, you know, sort of saying we're going to revitalize um, uh, Buddhism into Tibet. He was originally called kind of like the Luther, Martin Luther of Tibet. I don't think that that's really a good um, uh, comparison for a bunch of different reasons, good and bad. But um, it was the idea, I think, in some ways that Jason Kappa, who studied, who's kind of like the original, one of the original Rime guys, like he studied with uh, all sorts of teachers from different traditions of his day, mostly Sakya, uh, Karma, and Vrikankagi, but also very, very one of his teachers, very, very famous Nyingma Lama as well. And was able to synthesize and put all these teachings together. But in a lot of ways, it was back to basics. He's like, um, you know, in the 1300s, 1400s, Buddhism, everything's a little bit mixed up in this and that in Tibet. Everything, sometimes people don't know what to study. Let's all take it back to um, what they call the Sarma, or the second wave of dissemination of Buddhism, uh, Buddhism in the 11th century, in particular by the great Indian, um, almost like his precursor, great yogi, teacher, and... Um, scholar Atisha uh, Deepakar Vijana from from uh, West Bengal and may I be like him kind of continue his project take everything back to basics and if Atisha was the one that famously was able to really teach and combine the what they call the vast and profound paths of Buddhism all the sort of ne negative critical dialectics from Nagarjuna or Nagarjuna as well as the positive um, mind only school teachings from Arya Sangha, which in India at the time was very hard to do. And let's say a lot of people didn't do it. He was able to teach um, both of these streams simultaneously in a really novel way of doing it when he came to Tibet and then devised the whole stages on the path to enlightenment, almost like a 21 step program, Buddhism for dummies, how to take people right from the initial elementary teachers of Buddhism all the way to full enlightenment using the highest forms of Tantra, but his Tantra Tisha was just amazing like that. But I can imagine someone teaching all the positive claims, you know, Buddha nature teachings, mind only teachings, and all the critical emptiness um, claims, um, well not claims, I mean kind of like the no view view you could say of um, the Madhyamika. So Tisha was amazing. And then Jason Kappa continued that um, that project and what they always say he was able to unify sutra and tantra at his day a lot of people started getting confused because they said oh if you're sort of a tan famous tantric yogi and yogini you don't need to you sort of transcend sutra you don't need to worry about things like karma and all this kind of stuff you're above all that you're just kind of doing magic and all sort of the the, the fast um esoteric mystical occult path you know you're like super amazing you don't need to do all this uh, you don't need any theory or any Buddhist philosophy. You're past all that. And then you have all the sutra people saying, no, that that's all kind of like shamanism and kind of like magic. That's not real Buddhism. Um, you know, those people are just kind of like magicians and running around being unethical because they think karma doesn't apply to them or, you know, be, uh, giving a little bit of a cartoon illustration here. But the point is there were those kinds of genuine confusions. And so Jason Kappa, when he came out and started teaching, it's like teaching, just taking it right back to teach his program of Lam Rim. And how Tisha taught Tantra, uh, Buddhist Tantra, in sort of the classical way from uh, Nalanda and three monastic uh, colleges um, in India. So kind of like revitalizing back to basics. A lot, I guess you could say, like a lot like Luther did in the sense, like let's Protestant Re uh, Revolution, John Calvin, let's go back to the Bible. Like we've got this whole Catholic Church Middle Ages period, all different metaphysics and the, uh, theology and different kinds of rituals and stuff and maybe people are a little confused or a little lost let's go back to the bible and see what's in that 
Like if everyone's confused and we don't know what it means to be a Christian anymore, you've got all these different contradictory, complex and oftentimes inconsistent or paradoxical positions. Let's see what it says in the Bible. Let's just get right back to Jesus's teachings and just see what he says, what it means to be a Christian. So in a lot of ways, Jason Kappa was doing that and kind of like the crown jewel in a lot of ways, uh, one of his crown jewels. We could say is the great Lam Rim Chenmo, um, the sort of the huge Lam Rim text that he did, but also the books that we're looking at, uh, Essence of True Eloquence. So anyway, so uh, uh, Robert Thurman did that uh, book. Uh, I think maybe Sam uh, took a Rinpoche. He might have done uh, an animated uh, novel on on Jason Kapper, a comic book, which is great. I have, I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, I got one of the original editions from uh, Geshe Mike Roach, uh, did that uh, King of the Dharma, which is an illustrated, absolutely like museum piece book on Jason Kappa's life. Uh, I think some of those are still kicking around, maybe on Amazon, very expensive, I'm sure. I think he was republishing it uh, in a soft cover version. So it's called like um, Lord, Lord of the Dharma, I think, or something like that. It's, it's Geshe Mike Roach's Song Kappa book. I really encourage everybody to um, to to get that book. It's just fab. It's, it's a, a Jason Kappa's life story with all commissioned art and these famous life story tonkas that, in particular, were at Ken Rinpoche's uh, New Jersey temple there that Geshe Michael used to to go to back, obviously, the seventies and eighties and nineties. And then uh, Tubden Jimpa, one of the great. Uh, it was His Holiness, his translator, so one of the great Tibetan scholars and practitioners now. Uh, he did, it's on the to-do list, I have it in the stack of my books to read, but he just came out with another biography, probably we could say the definitive biography on Jay Sung Kappa. It's quite thick, actually, and maybe that four years ago or something like that. I can't remember when that came out. So there's a lot of material if you want to go deeper for this. And again, like as Holmes Dalai Lama said, it's just amazing what one guy was able to do in terms of a teacher and building monasteries, building a tradition, in terms of always been in retreat and always doing research and always writing books. It's like, how did he do it? You know, so inspiring. And he's kind of like the gold standard. And he was just an incredible monk an incredible Masid and tantric yogi and kind of almost like a tantric shaman, great healer, great philosopher and great um, scholar and historian and great institutor and great artist and a uh, great monastic leader of the students and everything. He was incredible. So they say always that Jason Kappa, he is the manifestation in particular, the Buddha of wisdom, Manjushri, but also uh, Avalokiteshvara, Buddha of compassion and Vajvani, uh, Buddha of power. So when you do the long uh, Mikseme uh, prayer, it's you're getting, it's like a mantra of these three Buddhas, Buddha of, of compassion, wisdom, and power. So as you know the story, I'll get into that, but Rendawa, his Sakya teacher, Jay Sankapa said that, like he composed that prayer a little almost like Durrani for him. And then Rindawa says, actually, I'm offering it back to you as a gift. It is going to be your mantra. This is so sweet. They're so humble, like teacher and student to each other. Like, this is my gift to you. You're amazing. No, no, this is my gift to you. I'm turning it back uh, because you're amazing. No, 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 I don't accept it. I'm giving it back. It's kind of like going around in a circle, right? So uh, so that's the mantra that we use. And Jason Kapp is seen as one of the three great manifestations of the Buddha wisdom in Tibet. Of course, the other one being the, the famed uh, uh, Sakya Lama and a uh, great scholar and yogi Sakya Pandita. And he said that's probably in the 1200s. I can't remember the date. And then we're all roughly contemporaneous. And it's kind of, they said, one of the great missed opportunities uh, that Jason Kappa wasn't able to debate and talk and study and learn with and, and they could have taught each other and even written books together. He knows with uh, Lon Chenpa, Ranjan Bush ended up being one of the, the master luminary of the Nyingma tradition, whose a lot of his texts were sort of really became popular centuries later. He was in the 1300s. And I think it was only with Jigme Lingpa in the foundation of the Lon Chen Nintig um, uh, Nyingma uh, lineage that a lot of that, his books, became very, very popular. And of course, they're the books that everybody reads in the English tradition. Now, he's seen as the other uh, great manifestation of uh, Manjushri. So, um, uh, he, uh, uh, Jason Kampa, Manjushri in person, was born in 1357 and died in, or passed into Perry Nirvana in 1419. So, um, looking at my notes here, 
So he was born in 1357 in Sanka Valley of Amdo province. So Amdo province is just the northern, it used to be the northern, I think it's part of Sichuan, no, um, Qinghai province now in China. I, they've actually switched things up a little bit. I think that I can't, anyway, they, they brought in a new province there. It's around there or something. I can't remember. Go, go on the internet and find out. But uh, Amdo was, is traditionally the province where you have a lot of really famous uh, cultural writers, uh, artists. Um, the Tonka art there uh, is very, very famous. They do the applique Tonkas um, or scroll paintings there. It's very, very famous. And our lama, as I remember, she always used to say that, you know, Amdo traditionally, it's kind of because it's on the Silk Road, you got a split where there's a lot of Han Chinese people, uh, Uyghurs, uh, Hui Chinese Muslims there, uh, Mongolians and Tibetans. So it's almost like a big uh, crossroads. So there's a lot of um, almost like a, a renaissance, cultural renaissance where everyone's sharing stuff and you get a very high quality of Buddhist uh, teachers coming from that province. So he was born there in 1357. Sonka means onion, so it's the man from Onion Valley or Onion Land, which is what his name is. That's kind of like his figurative name. So a lot of people say that as a metaphor, it's like there's no center of an onion. It's just you keep pulling in and there's nothing. So it's like what better uh, image of emptiness, right, is the onion skin. Is you can't find a true essence or a kernel or anything to an onion. And here's probably one of the great masters of teachings on emptiness being called that, which is kind of interesting. So as you know, um, they had at his birth, there was all sorts of miraculous um, uh, sort of events that, that happened before he was born and, and when, he, when he was born. And one of them is there's a bunch of famous things, but his main monastery there uh, is Gumba Monastery, which was preserved uh, during the Cultural Revolution, one of the only ones in Tibet, because Chu Lai, who was... Um, Mao Zedong's uh, deputy and foreign minister, his, that was his mom's favorite monastery. And so she called him up and she said to her son, he was in the, you know, one of the top guys in Chinese government, not a single brick will be disturbed in that monastery by the Red Guards or else, you know, I'm going to kill you kind of thing. So he called up and said, that monastery is my mom's favorite monastery. It's not to be touched. That's where Jason Kappa sort of studied in kind of that whole area, sort of the flagship monastery. So Jason Kappa's uh, when he was born, you had this miraculous kind of birth, but the afterwards, I think it's the, his afterbirth, um, his mom buried it. It might actually, they, they might have put it in Kumbum Monastery in the courtyard, I can't remember, and that might have been chopped down. There might have been some kind of thing, but anyway, it um, the tree where it grew had all the D syllables. It might have even had the mantra in the leaves and on the bark. So they always said for centuries later, if you see the tree where Jason Kappa's um, uh, placenta was on the leaves, the, the uh, either Tibetan or Sanskrit letter for D-H-I-D, the seed syllable magistrate just reads in the leaf itself, the leaves on the bark. So um, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, sure, whatever. But um, it might have been the 1700s, I don't know. Uh, the Catholic Church, the Vatican, and sent um, different Jesuit missionaries to Asia. And there was two of them that were in Tibet. So this might have been in the 1600s, 1700s, I don't know, you could look. But famously, they went, it, I think it was at Kumbha Monastery. And they um, went there and they'd heard this. And of course, they're, you know, they're Christian and they're Catholic and they're like, yeah, Buddhism, whatever. And so there's, everyone's, you got to see this tree. It's like magic. And just goes to show you that Jason Kappa was just as incredible and like being, and yeah, whatever. So they went to see it and it's in their journal. They actually sent it back, their journals or whatever to the Vatican. So it's in their book. And they're like, oh my God, it's true. It's this tree has in the bark itself, the D magic seed syllable of manjushri even in the kind of the, the leaves it has the mantra isn't that amazing oh my god wow so jason kappa he must have been a pretty special guy and so of course those guys because they're not tibetan buddhists they probably don't even believe in buddhism they're good critics it's it's better to believe them because of course they wouldn't lie they get nothing to gain from that right if anything they would expose it as being fake uh if it was fake so he was born in Sanka Valley of Amdo province um, and ended up studying with the great uh, Kadampa teacher, Choje Don, uh, Donrup Rinchen, who actually came to his family and asked that he be his teacher. And he'd been given a prophecy by a famous yogi called uh, Sita Losangrangpa. 
uh, and he's the one that told him to give um, Song Kappa his name, uh, Song Kappa. And then, you know, the story, the magical story is that at the time of Buddha, there's a little boy that um, offered Buddha a crystal rosary and then Buddha accepted it, Buddha Shakyamuni, you know, this is whatever, 2,500 years ago. And then he said to students like Ananda and Mogayana, um, this boy will be a famous, incredible Buddhist teacher in the land of snows in Tibet, because the Buddha's all teaching in Nepal, so just kind of over the border hundreds of years from now, he's going to revitalize Buddhism, he's going to be amazing. And so he gave symbolically a conch shell to Jason Kapp, but they made a little trade, gave it back and said, just like blowing the conch shell, you will sound the Dharma in all directions uh, in your future life. So then the little boy gives it back something and then, um, but it gives it to Mangalyana. He says, cause he's like, Mangalyana is, is Buddha's um, yogi, like Ma Siddha kind of Ma, like shaman uh, student, right? Who has all these miracle powers and CDs. And so he says, uh, bury this, in this place in Tibet, because in the future, this is going to be where this little boy is going to become this great famous saint, and that's going to be his monastery. So psychically, like in uh, astrally, Mangalyana goes to Tibet and then buries this um, conch shell. So uh, later on, Jason Kappa's life, when he's founding the first Galupa Monastery, his flagship monastery, Gandan Monastery, or Tashida Monastery, they start digging the foundation. What do they find there? Of course, they find the conch shell. And of course, that ends up being in Gandan Monastery and sort of fulfilling this prophecy of the Buddha, right? Which is amazing. So anyway, that's the prophecy of he when he is born. So he left with his teacher, his Karampa teacher at three years old and learned the alphabet and how to read and studied with him for 13 years. At this point, he's doing all sorts of retreats, learned the entire Kadampa tradition of Atisha. And he uh, described this period in his own autobiography when we taught his students as saying that uh, in his famous poem, um, Destiny Fulfilled. So it's almost like even as a little boy here, it's like I'm fulfilling this destiny of Tisha's being on Tisha's uh, successor here, right? So 16 years old, he traveled all over Tibet and studied with over 50 different teachers from all different traditions at the time. And like I say, I think for the most part, uh, lots of his... Um, Teachers were mostly the, the popular lineages at the time were the Sakya and uh, different Kagyu lineages. Like the, the Nyingma traditions we know what now uh, ended up becoming more and more popular, more numerous, particularly at the end of the, the 1800s and in the 19th century because of these great, incredible luminary teachers, right? And all the different Tertans coming. But at the time, maybe not as much, right? And of course, there's no Galupa tradition uh, because he founded it. And then he also studied with uh, the Jonang tradition, which is sort of a break off of the Sakya tradition as well. Right? So his emphasis was the five great treatises of Maitreya, Buddha Maitreya, um, where the tre treatises that Arya Sankha got in visionary contact with the Buddha, future Buddha, Buddha of love. So in order to give the widest possible sense of the Mahayana Dharma. So he ended up studying the ethics, meditation, Buddhist psychology and philosophy. He learned all of these by heart, all 7,000 verses from Maitreya's five works and studied the commentaries on them as well. And that's, of course, extremely difficult. He then studied all the logic and perceptual theory of Dignaga and Dharmakirti and the commentary, in particular, the de uh, debate um, techniques of the Sakya tradition and the Kagyu tradition around um, sort of the, um, well, just all the logical commentary, in particular, from Dharmakirti on the um, teachings on valid cognition. So he, at this point, he was very influenced by Sakya Pandita and Bhutan, the two great, in particular, Sakya Pandita uh, being sort of an emanation of Manjushri at the time was probably the famous philosopher in Tibet, him and Bhutan uh, were the ones that everybody studied. So, and what he liked in particular was the idea that logic is essential to enlightenment. So in other words, um, a lot like um, in the Western tradition, you're looking at medieval period, uh, great thinkers like um, St. Augustine, really taking Neoplatonism, Platonism, and mixing it with the Bible. And later, Thomas Aquinas taking Aristotle and um, mixing that in building on St. Augustine's work. So Thomas Aquinas is uh, in Middle Ages period, maybe in the 11th century, I think, or 11th, 12th, I have to look. And so both of these great uh, kind of yogis and thinkers, uh, philosophers and great Christian mystics, they said the same thing, that it's not enough just to read the Bible and stuff. We also need a philosophy, a way of sort of explaining things uh, theoretically to ourselves that we overcome any confusions or doubts. 
right? So we don't just need faith, we need reason. So Jay Sung Kath, I've got a little quote here on the computer um, where, you know, this is in his autobiography in here. And so the first little quote that he has about studying all this is he, he says, quote, I'd already uh, struggled with sutra and tantra texts. And I was practicing again, teaching the impact of the profound when I realized that my view had not progressed far beyond the view that has learned nothing and knows nothing at all. So then I studied thoroughly all the essential keys that bring out the authentic view, which I found on the path of subtle philosophy that probes the profound, especially open up the text of Nagarjuna, and I resolved all perplexities completely, which is a really, really good quote. So um, he became more and more of a tantric yogi at this point. And, um, okay, so as he's doing all these retreats, and studying all this stuff, uh, uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So this is kind of interesting. So he's studying this. And I remember at one of the uh, Rinpoche always. Taught, it's a it's a Tibetan expression, which I remember. Um, just wanted to add this. Uh, it, he um, this term of like hairy renunciation, which I always think, how's that? Like, what's the translation for that? But uh, Rinpoche said that it's kind of like when you get goosebumps, right? So if something affects you so much, you get goosebumps. Like you love it so much. Like, you know, a great music, like you, the song comes on, like a Spotify, and like, oh, like you get goosebumps or it's like your favorite movie or comic book or whatever people watch or even it's your favorite vacation or something. We show up again to Hawaii. It's like, hey, I'm getting goosebumps. So they said that every time, Jason Kapp would break out all this logic that he was studying, like Dharma in particular, he would get goosebumps. It gave him more and more renunciation, more and more appreciation for studying uh, valid cognition in this sort of logical way of studying Buddhism, right? Which is beautiful. But at the same time, at this point, he's getting more interested in practicing doing retreats and tantra. So some of his uh, teachers want him more to be a scholar. And he's sort of saying, well, you know what? I want to meditate more and be a yogi and just go on retreat. So uh, Rindawa is one of his uh, famous um, uh, uh, Sakya teachers. And so he was really wanting Jason Kappa to sort of doing a little bit more work um, studying, for instance, and being a yogi, for instance. And they always had, he's kind of had a debate with some of his teachers too, and they had all different kind of opinions on stuff. So he had a quote here. Uh, uh, he writes a little poem, J. Sung Kappa. He says, it is said that there are two vehicles for the journey to perfect enlightenment, the transcendence vehicle and the deep pleasure vehicle. The secret chanters are much superior to the vehicle of uh, the transcendences. This is well known as the sun and the moon. Yet there are those people pompous of the sense of wisdom who verbally assert the truth of that saying, yet make no inquiry to the Vajra of the uh, vehicle of the profound. If such, they are supposed to be intelligent. Who else could be, uh, ever uh, be thought stupid? Alas, it's amazing that any should repudiate such an ex unexcelled path so hard to come across. So I entered the deep treasury of twin accomplishments, the Vajra vehicle, supreme vehicle of the victors, more rare than even the Buddhists themselves. And I worked hard at it and I studied it afar. So that's what makes Jason Kappa so special. He's this incredible philosopher, incredible scholar, and sort of historian and chronicler and all these things, getting all the original texts, sutras, and um, commentaries. But at the same time, he's really trying to put them in practice as a great yogi, in particular, he's getting deeper, deeper into tantra techniques. And again, not just studying the rituals and the books on them, but he's actually doing all the retreats to such an extent that some of his teachers might think, oh, you're giving up your studies kind of like giving up, you're not going to get your university degrees here because you're too busy kind of doing all this sort of magical kind of Qigong, kind of magic Buddhism in retreat. But Jason Kapp is like, well, that's our tradition. That's what we do. And this isn't a waste of time doing one to the exclusion of the other. Like I'm doing both of them. But in particular, I really want to get enlightened in one lifetime. I really want to practice Tantra and go deep with it here. So his Tantra teachers were Sa Asakya Rinch and Dorje, who taught him the Vajra Tantra. Uh, uh, Ping uh, Pianga Rinpoche is a Jikang Kagyu uh, Lama who taught him Maitreya teachings. Uh, Bodong uh, Pilk uh, uh, P. Ka Namgyal Jonang who taught him was a Jonang teacher who taught him Kalachakra, of course, the Jonang tradition uh, uh, starting from uh, Topopa, were famous for Wheel of Time Kalachakra teachings. 
Gyeongpo Laspa and Chokki Palpa were students of Bhutan and taught him a Goi Samaja, high Soka Tantra version of the Buddha power, uh, Vajrapani. Also taught him Haruka and Kala Chakra. He studied and practiced all of the four classes of Tantra and the Yoga Tantra Viruchana uh, in particular, uh, called Kunring in uh, Tibetan. So he received um, the high Soka Tantra version of the Buddha Wisdom Industry or Yamantaka Vajrabhairava from Dondra Brinchen, one of his first teachers. So he's an encyclopedia of knowledge of Sutra and Tantra, inspired by Tisha's example, who did the same thing. Tisha was an incredible tantric yogi and a great philosopher teacher and um, historicist, like um, uh, a great commentator on Buddhism. So um, he calls it the four square path method of harmonizing all apparent contradictions of Buddhism and the centerpiece and inspiration of the Lanmum Chenmum. So there's a quote here. So he says, all scriptures should be free of contradictions and their teachings emerge as the transformative precepts. Then the Buddha's intention is easily understood and the pitfall of abandoning the Dharma is avoided. Right? And then he said, I with firm, intense, enduring faith in Manjur Sri, the Buddha of wisdom, best banisher of darkness from the disciples' mind, I pray that all the teachings dawn as transformative precepts and applied myself to the required conditions. Okay. So uh, the uh, essence of true eloquence, the book that we're studying, basically we'll see that what this is the key to his whole path, you could say, which is uh, Robert Thurman called Professor Robert Thurman calls it the hermeneutics of hermits to accomplish this, organize everything into a ladder of philosophical development. So what we'll see with Essence of True Eloquence, which is called the art of interpretation, is like, how do we know how to practice Buddhism? Given all the different teachings, seeing that a lot of them might be inconsistent, paradoxical, sometimes confusing this, how do I organize them into a path that makes sense? How do I know what to take figuratively or metaphorically, symbolic, uh, symbolically? How do I know what to take literally? How can I organize something into sort of a scheme of priority? What's most important? What is the take home of Buddhism? What's the kernel of it? If I'm trying to be like sort of embody Buddhism, be a pure Buddhist, how do all these teachings, all this stuff I have to study, what's most important? What's the take home? What's the Coles notes? What's the fortune cookie thing I can pull out and get? So the key to that kind of like the, it is kind of like the puzzle key or the map is Jason Kappa's work here, Essence of True Eloquence, okay? Um, yes. So just looking at my notes here. Yeah, I've got at 40. So again, he's uh, in the midst of all this training and study process of total dedication, transcendent wisdom, intensely maintained over many, many years. At 41 years old, he had a big breakthrough. He was studying a commentary on Arya Nagarjuna, the second Buddha, who was the founder of the Middle Way School on emptiness, and um, also uh, getting uh, studying teachings on the other second the second Buddha rules because there's like the Arya Sang who taught the Mind Only School. The transcendent was in studio uh, this this text, and he studied with Don Grip Rinchen, one of his teachers, since 17, 19 years old. He was doing deep absorption meditations on emptiness and studying the works, in particular commentary works from Sakya scholar Jamke Namke Pal and Jonang scholar uh, Nampon uh, Pal, studying the Prashnaparamita or, or uh, wisdom teachings here. And at this point, was studying and meditating so much, they said he was in these deep absorption meditations day and night, like just all the time, not just studying and reading all these books, but really taking it and meditating deeply, in particular on emptiness. OK, um, so, yeah, so he uh, did this one retreat. He was in deep absorption meditation and they couldn't, uh, you know, you get this a lot. And, and the same thing you hear this in Japan and China. He was in such a deep retreat that other monks he was doing it with left the retreat like it was over. And he was still in some kind of like Jan absorption. So they left him there. And then later, we, I don't know, a week later or something, they came back to get him. He's still in this meditation, right? They kind of had to wake him up. So at this point, he wrote one of his famous books called Golden Rosary, which is a commentary on the wisdom teachings, the Prajnaparamita commentary on MTS. But again, he kept going deeper and deeper in his practice and meditation on emptiness. So, um, yeah. 
again, and through this whole time, yeah, I just, this is that quote where, you know, he's using going deep as meditation, but also using all his uh, teachings on valid cognition or philosophy to sort of inform his practice. So the little quote he had for Dharma Kurti there, he says, because of his insight in the second chapter of the treatise, uh, this is on valid cognition that expounds the image in the path. He was swept away by the involuntary, by an intense and measurable faith in the scheme and method of reasoning Dharma Kurti. And during this day that autumn, the mere sight of the volume of treatise on valid cognition would cause hairs in the back of his neck to stand up. And with the intensity of his faith, and invariably he could hold, not hold back his tears. So he's really getting somewhere at this point in his life. He's getting more and more spiritual realizations. And he just looks at his books and he's crying, oh, my God, because it's true. It's like, I know these guys, what they're teaching is true. What Asanga said is true. What Dharma Kurti says is true. What Nagarjuna says is true, because I'm not some academic philosopher or professor here. I'm getting these experiences in my personal life, like the validation that these teachings are true, that they're right, right? Um, okay, so he was swept away in faith and scheme and method of the reasoning here, which is good. So the essential idea that Buddha is to be followed as a teacher, not because of the dogmatic claim to authority, but because his teaching appeals to reason. It's a cultivated common sense uh, of the practitioner. But his authority is based on his attainment, whereby he became the very personification of rationality. So what Jason Kampa was saying is just, you know, the old classical Indian way is like, what makes this true? Like, what makes me want to believe in Buddha or believe in the teachings is he's teaching me to think for myself and examine my own experience, put the teachings into practice and get the results pragmatically. And because this is happening, and I'm seeing that it's done through practice my experience but also through reason and study it's like i believe buddhism more and more and i believe in buddha as a teacher more and more right um yeah so then jason kappa traveled from the monastic college to monastic college for the next 11 years at this point getting different teachings and working on his golden rosary text his now uh, teacher, famous teacher, was, of course, the famous Saki teacher, Rendawa Zonu Longros, uh, who lived from 1349 to 1412. And he was a very, very famous uh, uh, Saki, in particular, sort of uh, famous scholar, Saki scholar and philosopher, and in particular, Chandra Kurdi scholar. Chandra Kurdi was one of the great Majimika philosophers, commentators on Aryan Agajuda. They became close friends and, and were teachers and students to each other. And this was uh, marked the period of the deepening of Jason Kappa's thought and practice. So what's so sweet about Jason Kappa is he's such an amazing guy that his teachers become students of him as well. So I actually really like that is that he's so humble and he's everyone's student, but because he's such a good student, his teachers become his students. So they become teacher and student with each other. And what I do like is that you see, you know, as... Um, Buddhism became a little bit more dogmatic in the 19th century in Tibet, which is a little bit sad, but kind of like the old days, what I like is you see a lot of these great uh, saints and thinkers, they actually disagreed with their teachers a lot. They had different opinions on stuff and would write different books where they'd actually criticize each other's work. And yet they still saw their teachers as being enlightened. The teachers still loved them as students, but they could say, and so what was interesting is Rindawa, well, the Saki tradition was kind of split in half over, let's say, views on emptiness of other emptiness of self. But even Jason Kappa, even though he's sort of on the same side Rendell was, they used to sort of criticize each other's thinking and say, I don't agree with that book that you wrote. I think it's, don't think it's right or whatever. And Jason Kappa was like, well, I don't like your book. Like, <laughs> I think there's problems. So everyone had such open minds with their practice and with the material, which I think is really, really good. Okay, so he started at this point working on his great famed Lam Rim, great uh, stages of the path to enlightenment, his, his masterwork on Lam Rim, which we all know. And at this point, as he was writing this, um, he remembered that he had at age seven, a visionary meeting sort of in the spirit world with Atisha. And Atisha basically said, like, continue my legacy, be like me. It's almost like as a little boy, he was like, I will great master, great teacher, I will follow in your footsteps here by working and um, fleshing out, deepening your long rim teachings, which you you created. And it's kind of like passing the, the family business on to me, right? 
At this period, he read all the tantric literature, Supreme Meditation, Virachana Realization, Compendium of Principles, Glorious uh, Esoteric Communion, which is Goy Samaj and so forth. So a little quote on this, the ultimate of all eloquent teachings of the sage is the glorious unexcelled yoga tantra. And among them, the most uh, innumerably profound is the king of tantras, glorious esoteric communion, which is Goy Samaja, right? So the king of tantras. The supreme philosopher Nagarjuna said about it that the essentials of the path of the root tantra are sealed therein by the six limits and four ways, and thus they must be understood by the guru's precepts in accordance with explanatory tantras. Holding that fact is crucial. I deeply inquired into all the subtleties of the holy tradition of communion, the ultimate sequence uh, instructions of the five stages, five stages of Goy Samaj practice, lamp of constituted practice, stages of array, etc. Relying on the bright illumination of the root tantra, combining the four great, uh, five great explanatory tantras, I practiced with enormous effort. With practice, I discovered all the essentials of Goy Samaj's two stages in general, and especially the essentials of the perfection stage. By the power of that, essential imports of many tantras, such as Supreme Bliss or Haruka, Havasha, Wheel of Time, or Kala Chakra, dawned in my mind as transformative precepts. So at this point, he's sort of admitting he's getting these very high spiritual realizations by practicing tantra and studying here. So uh, wisdom treasure is the name of Manjushri. Jason Kapanel considered Manjushri to be visionary presence to him informally to teaching him guiding him and even teasing him like that's what's so funny you get this kind of like in shamanic things where your spirit guides in the spirit world they end up um it's a lot like when you read the old testament it's sort of unique when you read the old testament that god has a personal relation it's the whole jewish invention that you get of course carried on christianity islam is that god's like a person in your life so in the Old Testament, you get that where God's like interacting with people, almost like a peer, even though, you know, he's God and you're just like a mortal, right? Where he's like mad at Jacob or like, you know, Esau, come here, Isaac, do this. And they're kind of like fighting and stuff like that. It's kind of funny. It's like a person, right? Or the way God and Moses get along. So you see this with Manjushri and uh, Sankhapa is Manjushri's enlightened being is like a wisdom God. And yet he's teaching him, but it's almost like old friends. And he's saying like, write this book. I don't like that. Redo this. And and he's constantly, he's very sweet, making fun of Jay Sankhapa. Like, you know, I love you. You're just amazing. Technically, you're me. We're the same being. But, you know, like at one point, you know, Jason Kappa's like, I suck. I'm not, even if I get this right, no one's going to read my books. And then Jason, like, some kind of motivates him to continue by always making fun of him. Like, who do you think you are, Mr. Genius? He's calling him like Mr. Genius all the time. So it's very, very sweet. And so um, at this point, uh, he meets uh, this famous uh, yogi lama, Saki lama called Lama Umapa. Uh, when he was 33 years old from Rong province, who came to study with Sankhapa on the Chanakirti and Nagarjuna texts, because Jay Sankhapa at this point had such a huge reputation as being this amazing yogi and amazing scholar. So Lama Umapa is one of these crazy kama, almost like a shaman yogi, right? He's just like tantric yogi. And he used to be, uh, he was an illiterate cowherd who got a vision of Manjushri when he was younger and then cultivating experiences all the time. So he was able, Manjushri appeared as like a blue Manjushri like Raphael Manjushri and was able to communicate. So he's like channeling Manjushri all the time. And so he shows up to, to um, get all these teachings from Jason Kappa. And then Jason Kappa is like, you're amazing because you can channel this Buddha and I can ask, you know, it's like an oracle or a medium, you know, I can talk to Manjushri through you and ask questions and get stuff. So they just started doing all sorts of tantric retreats, practice together and on the breaks, like Lama Mappa will go into trance and channel Buddha Wisdom Manjushri and Jason Kappa could ask him questions, right? You know, again, like a like a medium kind of like trance, like um, uh, Edward Casey or something. He's just like lying down, you know, uh, a lot like the um, different kutas, what they call oracles, like for uh, Nation, for instance, for the Tibetan government or whatever else, right? So 20 years of concentrated study and also deep yogic meditation uh, retreats that Jason Kappa did, he said the profound view is hard to find, like the real view on emptiness, the, the core of Buddhist teachings, really, really hard to get. The idea of the intellectual pursuit is a path of philosophy, can produce transformative change, but it must be continued until the very end, till complete clarity is reached, as, as Robert Thurman says here. So basically, uh, you studied all intellectually, 
reading all the books, studying all the laws, but the big thing is you don't stop till you get enlightened. So you, you take all the teachings and then you go into deep meditation retreat to realize them and you never quit till, till you get it. So Manjushri channeled through Amapa, kept pushing Jay Sankapa. Okay. And then it's a little quote here. Uh, Jay Sankapa is in the question. Um, Benjushri through Lama Bapa, his oracle, right? And he said, when uh, he questioned, debated, and analyzed further to regard the, the whole view of emptiness, holy Manjagosha, Manjushri repeatedly declared, quote, you should never allow yourself to cling to preference for either the appearance side or the empty side, but you might must take special consideration of the appearance side. So in the two truths, don't separate them. Don't separate karma and emptiness or relative reality and ultimate reality. They're not separate. They're together. Don't prefer one over the other. They come as a whole package. But he says, you must take special consideration of the appearance. In other words, always you don't favor it as being better or separate, but pay attention to karma. So just like Guru Rinpoche, Padma Samava says, my view is as vast as the sky. My attention to karma or details of karma is as fine as flower. Um, Manjushri says, this is what you have to do. So always work on your merit. Keep all your tantric vows, do tons of merit that you're able to realize emptiness. Uh, so that's what he started doing, sort of kind of like personal advice, right, from Manjushri here. Um, yeah. So parts of the essence of true eloquence concerning the presentation convention reality are the most important. So in essence of true eloquence, the book that we're seeing He's cashing out this quote, this advice right from Man, for, right from Manjushri. This became kind of like his fortune cookie or his motto, right? That sort of pith or heart teaching from Manjushri here. So this ends up being, to be honest, getting clear on um, the nature of karma or conventional reality is the most important thing that Jason Kappa is actually trying to do. And that forms the crux of the teachings that will get in essence of true eloquence. In particular, um, we're going to see the understanding of conventional reality from the two Madhyamika schools, see what they call the autonomous syllogism school, uh, the uh, Madhyamika Svotantrika, and the middle way consequential school pressing. You get him understanding the distinction and seeing what the real highest view on conventional reality, relative reality, or karma is from the Prasangika standpoint, is the key to enlightenment. So that's like the, the real crux of the matter is understanding that in this book. So he's working on this, you know, like uh, doing all this work and um, a little quote here uh, that where that he, um, Robert Thurman will get into this in later classes, just like my favorite philosopher, Jason Kappa, like my favorite philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, or the exquisite and liberative understanding of surface reality or conventional reality, the bedrock of the conventional, it's nearness and in beauty, it, uh, what it's, he, as he says, it's nearness and beauty, and yet it's maddening elusiveness. Uh, so I like that. Like conventional reality is right under your nose, but trying to understand what it is, is the hardest thing. How do we understand karma? How do we understand relative reality? Emptiness is just being voidness in a lot of ways is a lot easier than understanding the appearances or experiences of my life. So at this point, Jason Kappa went to the heir uh, of Lama Bhutong, received many uh, tantric initiations, and uh, went with uh, Lama Makpa to uh, pursue these more deeper studies, channeling Manjushri, their Buddha of wisdom. After this, he went to very deep um, into the view to refute this, uh, you know, just understanding the middle way between eternalism and nihilism, that everything is as truly or doesn't exist at all. He's doing more and more retreats on this. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll sort of leave this aside. This is just sort of, at this point, he's just trying to understand conventional reality, trying to understand the sort of the middle way between the two extremes. And he's saying that he's getting hung up on this and getting a lot of confusion still, right? So um, he felt that he was still a little confused and he was talking to Benjushri through Lama Bapa, and uh, Benjushri said, told him, make more prayers and offerings and do more and more retreats, and then the correct view or correct understanding of emptiness will arise. But do this 
a solitary retreat, not just with um, your teachers, Lama Mapa Rendawa, like, you know, sort of at monastery, go into solitary retreat this way, which is exactly what he did. He took his text on Chanakirti's commentary to Nagarjuna on emptiness and did retreat. And then on breaks would meet with Lama Mapa and talk to Manjushri to um, sort of discuss the results of his meditation. And at this point, he started getting, which I always like, he could channel or see Manjushri directly. He didn't need Lama Mapa to channel him, even though they're still friends and teachers and students and stuff. At this point, he would see Manjushri directly in the way I always like, where Manjushri's gold and orange Manjushri surrounded by a beautiful lapis blue globe of energy. And at the, the sort of edge of it are the five rainbow colors of the five elements, right? So uh, blue, uh, green, yellow, red, and white. So I love that image. It's like Manjushri's a sun, an orange, beautiful sun. And then you've got lapis blue around that, that Jason Cap would see that in the sky and be able to talk to Manjushri directly and ask him questions directly here, which is really, really beautiful. So at this point, uh, Manjushri, once he gets this, he just starts giving him initiations and teachings and energy blessings directly, right? So he gave the direct empowerments of Manjushri, the famous sort of uh, Kanonimination scripture and so forth, the outer inner secret Kalarupa or um, uh, Dharma Raja empowerments and Yamantaka, Vajabhairava or wrathful Manjushri practice. So this is the winter of 1392 to 93. So again, Manjushri told him to do deep retreat. He went to uh, Baya Brawl Hermitage with the eight of his uh, famous uh, students, top disciples at this point. And this is the one you always hear about. They do this deep retreat where they do 100,000 prostrations to each of the 35 uh, confessional Buddhas, uh, hundreds of thousands of mandal offerings, millions of Vajrasapa purification offerings, and they did tons of Goisa Manja deep uh, lay rung retreats. Uh, and then they moved in 1394 to Wolcott. That's the famous retreat hermitage where they do even more of that. And at this point, Jay Sankapa got the vision of the 35 uh, confessional Buddhas, Tara Ushanisha Vijaya, Buddha of Wisdom, uh, the female Buddha of Wisdom, Saraswati, which is the Buddhist goddess of the arts, all the great Bodhisattvas, and was able to talk directly to Arya Nagarjuna, Arya Sangha, and Saraha, famous tantric yogi Masita Saraha, in sort of astrally or like visionary contact. So this is the one where Jason Kampa could see all the, he did like millions of prostrations. So he could see the 35 confessional Buddhas, but not their face. Their face is all kind of blurry. So he's like, what's going on? I can't, I can't see that in Menjish. He's got more bad karma, more prostrations. So he did like another million prostrations. Then you could see their faces clearly. So at Wolkap, you can go there. And they said that there's a, in the stone, there's a groove from where he did all those prostrations. Like literally his body kind of sanded down this rock. So it's like super smooth, just from Jason Kappa doing like millions of prostrations, which is amazing. So this one you can see, it's a famous art uh, um, uh, sort of thing that you see in Tonka, as I've seen it here in China, uh, in Tibet, it's where they they have Manjushri with his eight students, and then he's having a vision of Manjushri, and Manjushri sticking his sword into Jason Kappa's heart, and it's like, ah, I guess all this energy and realizations, right, and then from his heart, there's energy going out to the hearts of his eight students, right, so that's the vision where he actually gets this, where uh, Manjushri puts his touches his heart and all this nectar and light go directly into his heart when he's in retreat here. And at this point, he is shown when he's going to get enlightened. And he'll be known as Buddha Sim, uh, Simhanda or Lion's Roar in a, in a different parallel universe uh, called Ab, Abu uh, Taya, Abu, Ta well, Abu Taya, I guess I'm not. Anyway, or a miraculous array. That's kind of the world system where he becomes Buddha. So 1395, he leaves Wolka retreat. And at this point, all the, um, the one of the great um, things that they do in this life is he goes out of retreat, him and his students, and they refurbish and renovate this beautiful statue of the future Buddha, Maitreya, Buddha of Wisdom. I, I, I should say Buddha of Loving Kindness and the future Buddha. It's kind of like we're saying we're creating the karma that you come into our world system now and teach more Buddhism, to bring in the era of peace of the next form of Buddhism. And so it's kind of this Maitreya statue is all falling apart. So him and his eight students spend all this time and they fix it up. And all the local people come and they're happy and they do this big consecration of it and so forth. And when they consecrate the big statue, everyone's seeing all these visions of Buddhas in the sky and this kind of thing. 
So you see for the next three years, he's kind of in semi-retreat with his students and studying with Kanchen Namkai Gelsen, a famous Nyingma Lama, that he would see his Vajrapani Buddha power, kind of like Blue Buddha directly, and gets all these tantric teachings from this Nyingma Lama, who's a very good Lama, who said that, Jay Sankapa, you're not my student, you're my teacher. And then Jay Sankapa says, ha ah, no, you're actually my teacher. So back and forth, they're teacher and student to each other. And um, uh, 1398, he's studying Buddha. So this is the famous one where again, he's having a hard time understanding the middle way of two truths. And he's studying Buddha Palita's commentary on Nagaju. And again, he's having all problems. And this is the famous thing where he has this vision where he's in Tashita Pure Land or something. And I, I'd heard once it was like Buddha Shakyamuni was there, but these great saints, uh, Nagarjuna, Arya Deva, Baba Vivekan, Buddha Palita, and Chandra Kurti are all there kind of arguing this point that he wants to learn and he's like what and so he's in the audience listening and he's like oh my god they're, they're actually talking about the, the last little point that i need to learn right and then at this point uh buddha palita gets up kind of out of the group of them with his book and comes and kind of hits his book touches his book to jason kappa's head so jason kappa wakes up and goes to his library pulls out buddha Palita's book looks in the index what is karma or conventional reality for the two truths and it's like, okay, now I get it. And there's a great quote in it where it says, it is an imperative consequence that the self is not the same as the aggregates and the self is not different from the aggregates. So we read this quote in Buddha Palita's work and bang, it all kind of comes together. He has this huge breakthrough of emptiness. And um, they said that the world change that had been upside down before, the authentic view is precisely the opposite from what he had expected, which is, of course, our teacher, Annie Land McNeil, we said, you don't jump off the cliff, you fall off it. So he'd had everything in his understanding kind of ass backwards, which is, of course, what we always do. And he had this profound experience of emptiness. So at this point, he, uh, Davis Evans in 1398 here, he uh, writes the famous poem, uh, which is praise uh, teach, uh, to Shakyamuni for the teaching of relativity, praise of dependent origination, which you can get in all his books. That is the short form for essence of true eloquence. So he wrote that poem in the morning of his enlightenment. He has the whole enlightenment. He's fully enlightened. And he's like, I finally got it. And it's funny who he thinks. He thinks, I'm thanking you, Buddha. You're the one that taught this. You taught the two truths. You taught emptiness and karma. You taught that by understanding dependent origination, you em understand emptiness. By understanding emptiness, you understand dependent origination. And then he cashes that poem out into a longer book. That's Essence of True Eloquence, which is the book that we're um, studying, which based in a lot of ways is praise of relativity. So again, just to conclude here, uh, the four great the major deeds of his life. So sometimes they just say, what are the, uh, you know, the four great deeds. So number one was the refurbishings of Zingri, Maitreya statue in 1395. I talked about it. Um, he also instituted um, in uh, basically in 1409, in particular, made a yearly thing, but in 1400, it was the great um, Monlam festival, or prayer festival around New Year's, where this was, um, uh, so at the same time, he revitalized the whole uh, monastic tradition, ordination tradition, by getting all these great teachers together and teaching the Vinaya Sutra. Na, uh, Namse Ling, the Cathedral of Yongin Chug, Ryashe, Rindawa Rinpoche, Losawa, um, uh, Kamchog, uh, Palzenpo, uh, all these famous lamas came in, invited the altar, and they taught um, the Vinaya Sutra for months and then ordained all these monks and nuns, I guess, too, and sort of revitalized becoming ordained, which has sort of fallen out of favor and people weren't pure monks or nuns. They didn't have the right rituals or commentary on it, right? Showing that the foundation of uh, the Dharma is the Hinayana pass of the three trainings of moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. So that was the big thing. And then um, the Monlam festival that they have every year, all these patrons come in, in Lhasa and they have uh, even the Ming dynasty was paying for a lot of it. China, and they have all the different teachers and different traditions that come and over New Year's, as you know, if you've done the Monlam Festival before, now every sect is sort of tradition has its own Monlam Festival. We have the, the Galupa Monlam Festival, Kagi Monlam Festival. But in the old days, it's like everyone taught together here. 
unless all these famous teachers it's kind of like a big rock festival like music festival like dance music festival what is it um, electronic dance music festival um over like a week or something it's the same kind of thing and everyone does all there's all pujas and it, it all the people come and everyone gets to eat and listen to teachings all the time so it's like a big celebration for for ringing off the new year new year so the jason Kappa instituted that and that was just amazing making all the offerings in Lhasa at the Joel Rinpoche statue of Buddha Shakyamuni as a young prince, Prince Siddhartha at the Joking Cathedral. And then the last one, of course, is building the flagship monastery of Gandhian Monastery that we talked about. And there he spent years getting the physical. Nowadays, we have all the fancy plastic, you can get plastic mandalas and computer programs showing Buddha universes. But in the old days, you had to make them physically. So they got the Goya Samaja, Yamantaka, and Haruka, the, the main tantric deities. They did all the 3D Buddha universes, the Buddha mansions or castles of these Buddhas, all with gold and silver and rubies and lapis and everything. And they it took them years to put that. I was in 17, 14, 17, and it ended up being consecrated at uh, Gandhi Monastery. He had all that. And of course, all of that was stolen in the Cultural Revolution because it's all gold and jewels and everybody stole it. Anyway, that was there for centuries. Um, and the famous thing is, you know, when we do so, when the Gopi we sing Song of the Spring Queen that he wrote down and they said that he heard that song being sung by the Dakinis in the air as they were laying the foundation for Gandhian Monastery. So all the spirit world and Buddhas are so happy that Gandhian Monastery was being built, that they were singing the song as everyone was starting to build the monastery together. So in 1417, he passed into Peri Nirvana and reached enlightenment in the Bardo. And he all says, as he died, his body turned into the appearance of a 16-year-old man, just street, sort of all golden, which is really, really beautiful. And they put his mummy in a stupa at Gandhian Monastery, which was there until, fortunately, the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. So the last one, which is good, as I just will say, is in 1402, which is a very, very famous one, um, uh, that when he was writing the last stuff on emptiness, after Essence of True Eloquence, he, he writes a chapter on, on Vipassana for the Great Lam Rim in 1402. And that's where he writes, they say that that's his best stuff on emptiness. Like he kept improving on how he was writing it. And so he asked for help um, from Manjushri, like in a vision. He's like, please help me again. I hope I can get this right. And he gets all these blessings and kadang. And as he was writing it, he saw all the letters of um, the text would appear in his mind as he was writing it on the page in gold letters, and he would just trace it, right? And then he saw all the text and all these journeys and mantras, everything in gold in the sky that he could read. It's kind of like a like like a sort of a hologram, right, of the text in the sky there, which is really really beautiful. And um, then he had, at the same time, a, a vision of the 20 emptinesses of the transcendent wisdom, 100,000. And so at this time in the sky, the explanation of the 20 emptinesses are in all traditional Sanskrit in uh, three-dimensional silver Sanskrit letters all around him in a vision, which is really, really beautiful. So uh, Robert Thurman said that technically his all his life's work, all everything that he did should be considered his four, his fifth major work, in particular, all the books he wrote, because his speech, his whole view is given to us as a path for our enlightenment, which is the greatest thing that he ever did, really, because we're benefiting from that. And the 14th Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama always said that when you read Sankapa, and it's true, what you, what's shocking about it as, as a text, there's so many have different styles, right? Like in Western philosophy, it's like that. Very few philosophers have a style that are good writers. Um, Kierkegaard, uh, Willard Van Orman, Quine's considered, you know, whatever you like, philosophy of science and logic, but th they're considered amazing writers, for instance. Um, in France, Jean Heap lives in one of the great uh, Hegelians. He translated Hegel's Phenomenal Spirit into, Fr into French, and it won the Literature Prize, like of France, because it was so well done in French. Um, so some, but most of the time, it's terrible. You read Heidegger, you read Hegel, Husserl, Aristotle, Plato. It's horrible. It's it's almost a can't. They're they're horrible books because they're so hard to read. You don't know what the guy's talking about. This and that. 
so it's it says the same thing with Buddhism, a lot of the original texts. So what, the thing with Jason Kappa, when you read his books, it's unique. And the Dalai Lama says this, they're so clear and easy to read. Like just like Manjushri, it's like they're transparent, especially his stuff on Tantra, where usually you read stuff on magic or esoteric or occult stuff, and you don't know what it means. Like, you know, this Jungian stuff on alchemy, what, what's all the symbolism? Uh, then you read Jason Kappa stuff, and it's just clear. It's like... It's like like a YouTube video on how to fix your sink. And then you think, how could he do that? Like make stuff that's so hard, the philosophy of the tantric stuff. And it's he makes it sound so easy. That's his real gift in one of his major deeds is that he's sort of unique in Buddhism to have been able to do that. Anyway, there you go. I know that it ran really, really long. I'm sorry about that. But it is, uh, you have to sort of hear about how amazing this person is. And this is the context for us reading the book. This is kind of like our last course I'll be doing on sutra and stuff probably for a while. And I just wanted this text to be the last text that we do that when we go into Tantra and study Tantra, you have all the faith in the correct view. No more doubts. The quiescence of all perplexities, as Nangarjuna says. And it's easy to be able to walk into the light of your enlightenment at that point. So by the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, the power of pure spring tension, we all of our dharma wishes be fulfilled. Okay, see you next time.